God's covenant. And whenever we read through the Bible, I mean, from the very beginning, I mean, uh, we think about, uh, you know, maybe I, I got a couple questions here that, uh, you know, uh, what is a covenant? And then what's the types of covenants are in the Bible that God made with these people? And then, how was a covenant made? And then, what are the, the covenants God made? And then, how does Jesus fulfill the covenants? How does he fulfill it? I mean, every covenant that was made, and then you may ask yourself, well, what is a covenant? What is, what is that? And from, from what I, I can understand on it, it is an unchangeable uh, legal agreement between God and man. And it's the uh, condition of the relationship. You know, and I thought about us. We know what a contract is. About every one of us could understand what a contract is. Uh, and Brother Jamie, there are sometimes we can... Uh, I've been known to buy things. I've been known to sell things without a contract. That's a bad mistake. You ought never sell nothing on cash payments, not even to your brother in Christ on payments without a contract. I have been burnt many times. It needs to be legit. It needs to be legal. But this is a contract with God. And who makes the contract? God makes the contract, Brother Jamie. He's the one that makes the covenant. He says, this is what it is. This is what you got to obey by. You can either take it or you don't have to take it. But this is it. And this is what types of covenants are in the Bible that God made with his people. And I'm going to try to pronounce these words right. There is a bilateral or a conditional covenant that both parties must meet an obligation to the covenant that we have just like a contract you sign a contract with somebody I thought about Brother Lester many times when I think about contracts I'm sure he, sell, he signs a lot of contracts when he takes a bid job on he's got a contract that he must sign that he's got a certain job to do and if you do that job, we're going to pay you this X amount of dollars. But if Brother Leston don't do his end of the bar, he have the contract, then he's not going to get paid. But if he does everything that he's supposed to do, at the end, the man has to pay him his money because it's on a contract. Neither one of them can break that. It's got, that's the only way they can do it is if one breaks it, the other one can get out of it. And that's the same thing as in a bilateral. And then there's an unlateral, I know I'm not saying that word right, but an unconditional. It's a covenant that one party is obligated to fulfill the covenant. Regardless of what happens, one party will fulfill it no matter what, no matter what happens. Whether you want to walk away or not, the other party will still fulfill the contract or the covenant. But as we think about them, what was the covenant? Some people may say there's, there's five covenants in the Bible. Some say there are six. Some say there are seven. But I've got eight. And if we go back all the way to the very beginning, to Adam and Eve, it was called, and I know I ain't going to pronounce these right, but the Enoch, Enoch Covenant. This was a covenant that God made with Adam. When he put Adam in the garden, he told Adam that he could have rulership, that he could rule over everything, that, and he could have be ruler for an eternity. But he had one thing. Don't eat from the tree of good and evil. That was the only stipulations to this covenant. Adam, this would be a bilateral. Both parties had to keep their end of the bargain. 
As long as Adam didn't do what he was supposed to do or couldn't do, then guess what? God was going to do what he said he'd do. He would do what he promised. He promised Adam you'll have eternal rulership. You will never die. But he told Adam, if you eat of that tree, you will surely die. And Adam surely died. He didn't die automatic, but death come to him. He was no longer an eternal being as far as in the human flesh. He still had an eternal soul, but the body would die. We think about that, and if we want to read that in Genesis, in the second chapter, in the 15th verse, let's just read that. I'm going to try to take my time, and we'll go over these, and if we get through all eight of them tonight, well, bless the Lord. If we don't get through all of them, that'll be all right too. But we'll just try to read that where God made that covenant with Adam there in the second chapter in the 15th verse of the book of Genesis. He said, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge and knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. So we just want to read that to clarify that, that these ain't my words that I'm saying, but these was the word of God. God made a promise to him. He made a covenant with Adam, but Adam broke that. And then we go on and we, we look at the next covenant was the Ad, Ad, Admatic covenant. This covenant would mean redemption. That God, no matter through all of their sinful ways, Sister Normie, that God was going to do whatever it took to be able to redeem Adam back to him. That he wasn't just going to put Adam out of the garden with no hope. That he wanted to redeem Adam back to him. And we can read this, in the, and this would be an unlateral. Even though Adam broke the first covenant, in the second covenant, God said, Adam, I'm going to, for redemption, I want to redeem you back. I want to be able to bring, be able to bring you back. Even though you messed up, even though, as Brother Randy, we know that sometimes we still sin. Sometimes we still fall short. Sister Norma, if it wasn't for these, the first time we sinned, then we would have no hope no more. God would say, you know what? You done broke it, you're out. You're done. And that's what the devil tells us many times when we fall short of God's glory after we've accepted him. The devil will tell us, well, you've done went too far. God will never forgive you. But he's a liar and the father of it. We know that if we'll come back with a broken heart and a contrite spirit, if we will realize we messed up, Lord, I'm sorry, that we know the book of John said that if we confess our sins, that he is just and faithful, forgiving us all of our sin and cleansing us of all unrighteousness, that we know that we can come back to the Lord. But we can read this in the third chapter in the 15th verse. And maybe somebody can pronounce these covenants better than I can. And he told Adam, he's telling Adam here, he said, And I will put the enemy between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall be bruised thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. You know, we can look at this all the way to the Lord, our Lord. How we know through this that I believe that the Lord is telling him, you know, as far as the serpent being the woman, and Christ being through Adam. That we know through and by the devil thought that he won whenever 
Jesus hung between the heavens and the earth, I believe Satan was laughing. I want to thank Sister Normie. Satan said, ha, I won this battle. I finally won. Yes, Jesus was bruised. But you know what? Satan didn't win. Jesus overcome death, hell, and the grave. That he overcome victory. He overcome sin. For the Bible tells us that Christ was the only one that never sinned. There was never no sin found in him. Even though Adam did, but he never sinned. Then we can go on to the third covenant would be the Noetic, the Noetic covenant. That would be restraint. Before I jump ahead of myself, if you think about covenant and what the word, if you look it up in the Hebrew language, it means to cut. That's what the Hebrew word means. Covenant means to cut. And we know that many times whenever there was a covenant made in the old days, back in the Bible days, between two men, they would take a lamb or a bull ox or they would take something and they would cut it in half and they would lay one on one half or one half on one side and one half on the other side. And these men would walk through this dead animal. And this was the, an agreement signifying that Brother Jamie, that my word is good. And if I'm not, if I don't stand on the covenant that I've made with you, the contract that I've made with you, then I am no better than this dead animal. And I've thought many times the old saying that we, we look at, that a man is no better than his word. If you can't trust his word, then you can't trust him. Brother Jamie, I believe that to be true. I believe a man ought to be what he says he is. And I believe if a man tells you he's going to do something, he ought to do it. They shouldn't be no backing up. And if a man can't do it, he ought to be man enough to come to you, or woman enough, either one. I say man, but I mean man or woman. But I mean you ought to be able to come to someone and say, hey, I can't fulfill that. I can't do that. As I've said, I've loaned people money before. Sometimes I said that was probably the greatest $20 I ever spent in my life. I loaned them $20 and never seen them again. But I've watched people dodge me over $5. Men I've worked with. Whenever it would have been so much easier for them to come and say, Man, I'm sorry, but I just ain't got the money right now to pay you back. I know me being me, I would have said, don't worry about that $5. Don't worry about that $20. But it bothered me more because they dodged me. They wouldn't speak to me no more. Over just a few dollars. They wasn't a man of their word. They've been many times I've had to go to those and say, hey, I'm sorry. I told you I'd pay you back today. I just ain't got it. And Brother Jamie, most times they'd say, don't worry about it. Get me next week. Matter of fact, don't even worry about it. But Sister Normie, I felt if I kept dodging them, no matter right now, if I still owed them money, I'd still feel like I owed them that money when it would have been easier just to go to them and talk to them. I think I got off sidetracked a little bit. But that's what it means is to cut the word covenant in the Hebrew language. The noetic we're going to jump over to Genesis in the chapter 8. It means restraint. And how God made a covenant with Noah. And we know when the, the, the covenant that God made with Noah, whenever Noah, God destroyed the world. He destroyed all the people. He killed everybody because they got so evil. They got so wicked. But God made a promise to Noah. That he would never destroy the world again with water. And he give us a rainbow as a promise. Even now when we look at that rainbow, it usually comes after a big rain shower. But we can still look at that and remember God's promise. That God said he would never destroy the world again with water. He didn't say he wouldn't destroy the world. 
but he said he wouldn't do it with water. He made Ad or Noah a promise. Then in the eighth chapter of the book of Genesis. In the eighth chapter and the 21st verse. He said, And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. For the imagination, is that right? Am I saying that word right? Of man's heart is evil. From his youth, never will I again smite any more. Everything living as I have done. You know, I believe God said there, He said, look, I know you're evil. You're going to always be evil. You'll always be sinful. But no matter how bad you get, Noah, I will never destroy this earth again with water. No matter how bad mankind gets again, I will not destroy it with water. He said He's going to destroy it, but now He made a promise. That would be a, a, another a covenant made that God's going to keep his side whether Noah kept his or not. It didn't matter what Noah ended up doing. God was going to keep his promise regardless. And he surely has. He's kept his promise. Then we look at the Abrahamic. I know I'm not pronouncing these right. They don't even sound right. <laughs> she said none of the other three was right yet but that one might be right <laughs> the Abrahamic Noah Noahamic I, I, I said I know I know I'm not pronouncing these right <laughs> but the Abrahamic covenant meant to restore it meant to restore then we go back into Genesis if we look in the 12th chapter of the promise that God made Abraham. And we'll jump over to the 12th chapter of the book of Genesis. Right there in the very first, first three uh, verses. He said, Now and the Lord hath said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make thee a great nation. And I will bless thee and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curse thee. And he that shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now we know that he made Abraham a covenant he made him a promise that that he would do all these things for Abraham and we know that in one part that we know that he told Abraham that his seed would become greater than the sands of the sea that we know that we was all even Jesus come through the lineage of Abraham through the lineage of Adam then on up to Abraham that we know that through and by Abraham came Christ down the road but as he made him these promises and we talked about there how they took and they'd cut an animal in half and they'd lay one on one side and one on the other side and men would walk through the center, Brother Jamie. But if we flip over to the 15th chapter of the book of Genesis, we want to read something where God, whenever he made this covenant with Abraham. And if we start there in the ninth verse, there in the 15th chapter, he said, and he said unto him, Take me a heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each piece one against another, but the birds divided he not. Now he's telling us there that he, he went and he cut them all in half, all but the pigeons and the birds or the dove. But if we jump down to the 17th verse, 
He said, And it come to pass that when the sun went out and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land. From the rivers of Egypt unto the great river, the rivers of, I can't pronounce that word, Euphrates. But we looked there that, you know what, we spoke there in those days how both men would have to pass through the cut pieces of animal. But here Abraham didn't go through, did he? Only God walked through the middle of them. God is the smoking furnace and the burning lamp. That was God that passed through there whenever he made the covenant with Abraham. He passed through. To be able to show Abraham, Abraham, no matter what you do, your seed will be greater than the sands of the sea. You may back up, you may do wrong, but no matter what you do, Abraham, my promise will be fulfilled. And God surely did fulfill his promise through Abraham, which Abraham walked after God. He was a faithful man of God. And you think about that, that he promised Abraham or the children of Israel, he promised them their land, that they may have their land back. Brother Jamie, still to this day, they've not got their land back. But it's coming. The Israel people, the children of God, they will one day reunite their land. Their land will be there. Yes, there's people living in Israel. They're still fighting for it. Matter of fact, they're fighting for it today. We know the war that's going on right now in Israel. They're still fighting for that land. But there's going to come a day when Jesus comes down, he ends it all. He sits on the throne of David and them people will have their land back. There'll be no more fighting, Brother Roger. The fight will be over. His people will go home. Some people may say, well, is it just the children of Israel? No, those that have, like us, that we were not Israelites, but were grafted in. We were Gentiles, but now we're no longer Gentiles. Now we are the sons and daughters of Christ. That is our land, just as it is a true Israelite's land. That is our land. That is the promise that God made them through and by this covenant. Did you notice, Brother Ernie, in the Greek, Phyllis, I want to say, illustrations, forgive me, I know that's the full way to say it. Only one wasn't divided, the other was the dove. Yeah, the. the Hmm. I never thought about that. Yeah, he had a she-goat and a ram. And he divided both of them. And he had a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he didn't divide neither one of the birds. But he divided that. Well, that's good, Roger. Hmm. Never thought about that. So you're saying that, that the she-goat represented the woman and the ram represented the man. That's good. All right, let's try to pronounce another one of these. The Mosaic. Does that sound right? All right, the Mosaic covenant. Mosaic. Mosaic. I still can't say it. I get tongue tied. You wait till the. You wait till we get to the next one. <laughs> Was well, any of y'all ever studied these, the covenants of God? Like I said, this is something that just uh, has come up on me to want to learn about the covenants of God. And I thought, well, while I'm learning, why can't I might be able to teach somebody else something? Well, I'm doing the promises of God. So you do the covenants, I'll do the promises. We'll meet somewhere. 
Uh -huh. But there's 9,000 promises. You got a lot of promises. <laughs> <laughs> so do you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> They're all right. The Mosaic Covenant <clears throat> means reveal. And we can read this in Exodus in the 19th chapter in the 5th verse, starting there in the 5th verse. And we think about reveal. What was he revealing? We know that this was the time that, that Moses, that God wrote down the Ten Commandments and gave to Moses. And we know that I believe that God was trying to reveal to them that no matter how good you think you are, no matter how hard you try, you will not keep these. You're going to fail one of them. And the Bible says, Jesus said, that if you mess up on one, you done messed them all up. If you failed at one of the Ten Commandments, you've done failed them all. So it don't matter. You can say, well, Lord, I just done one. No, you done done them all. And I believe God was trying to reveal to his people that, hey, you need a redeemer. You're going to have to have a redeemer. No matter how good you think you are, we even read about the young ruler that come to Christ and Christ gave him, I think it was six or seven of the commandments, and told him, said, you know, honor thy mother and father, uh, be good unto thy neighbor. Uh, he gave him all these things, and at the end, he said, Lord, I have kept these from my youth up. He thought because of his good works, because he, he had kept the law. But Jesus said, look, he said, go sell all thy has and follow me. Give unto the poor and follow me. Well, two of the commandments that we don't see there that Christ gave him, the first commandment is love thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, and all thy might. He didn't tell him that one because he knowed he already failed that one. And what was the other? Love thy neighbor as you love yourself, I believe. Yeah, that was it. Because if he loved his neighbor, he'd be willing to sell all he has, give to them, and follow after God. If he loved God with all of his heart, he'd be willing to lay it all down. As we said many times, it wasn't that he that he had great possessions that he should go sell all these has, but the Lord knowed his heart and knew where his heart was at. It was in his possessions. It was in what he had. So the Lord knowed that he done failed two of the commandments. So he might as well have failed all the other ones. It didn't matter that he was great to his mom, that he was uh, not a stealer, that he wasn't a liar, that he, that he didn't covet his neighbor. It didn't matter about those things because he done failed the first two, Jamie. So them other ones that he kept wasn't going to get him into heaven. He done failed too, so he was guilty. So he needed a redeemer. He had to be redeemed. Now I think this is what the Lord was showing Moses and showing us today. That we had to have a redeemer. We must have something to redeem us back to Christ. And as we read these covenants that God has made, and we see even through Adam, no matter what, God's promise that God is going to do everything it takes to redeem his people back to him. No matter how far you've went, Jamie. That's why we preach many a times, and the devil will say, you've went too far, you've done too much. God would never save someone like you. But God says, I would go to the uttermost. That you can't go so far that God will not save you if you realize, as we spoke at the beginning there, you'll realize that you're lost and you need Christ. That he'll save you. So we, as we read his, as he was revealing to them, we start there in the 19th chapter in the 5th in the, uh, verse there. He said, Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar, peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Now we look at that and that would be a bilateral command or a covenant. That would be something that a covenant God made with them that they had a part that they had to keep. 
if you don't keep this, this is what's going to happen. And we go on up here and read, and we'll try to get into something else on this in a second. But if we read there in the eighth verse, and he said, And all the people answered together and said, All that thy Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the word of the people unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, and the people may hear when I speak with thee, and believe thee for every ever. And Moses told the word of the people unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people, and sanctify them a day and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes. And be ready again the third day, for the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people unto Mount Zion. Now here's the Lord, you know, he's made a covenant. He gave them something. He said, look, if you'll keep my stature, if you'll do what I want, you will be my people. Now these people had a choice to make, Brother Jamie. And we read in the 24th chapter of the book of Joshua how Joshua gathered all the people together. The Bible says from the high priest down to the very bottom. And he even asked him a question. He said, look, will you serve the gods of your fathers or will you serve the true and living God? For we serve a jealous God. He said, make a choice. Choose you this day whom you will serve. They said, we choose to serve God. They had to make a choice. These same people here, they had to make a choice. But we know we read over in the book of Exodus on over there a little bit. I can't remember the chapter it's in. But Brother Randy, we read where God said that if you do this, I will bless you. I'll bless you in your curbers. I'll bless you in your children. I'll bless you in your fields. And he goes on saying, I'll bless you, I'll bless you, I'll bless you. But he says, if you don't do these, I will curse you in your cupboards. I will curse you in your fields. I will curse you in your children. Everything that he said, I'll bless you with, he said, I'll curse you. So this was a covenant that God made with them that they had something they had to do. If you don't keep your part, what I'm telling you, I'm going to curse you. But if you keep it, you walk in my stature, he said, then I'm going to bless you. We know we hate to think of it today, but Brother Jamie, even as much as we fail, and we know God redeems us, God forgives us when we come back with a broken heart and a contrite spirit. But honey, I'm telling you, I believe that whenever you're walking the way God would have you to walk, I believe God's blessing you. Because Sister Normie, I'll tell you, you get out of the grace of God, and you'll find out things just don't go so good, does it? Things start falling apart. Things start happening. I don't know, but this is just for me. And this is the way my little feeble mind thinks. But sometimes I think God's got to give me a little spanking to get me back on track. If it means me driving down the road and me thinking everything's hunky-dory and the tar falls off my truck, I think, Lord... I might want to get back where you had me at. Maybe this wouldn't have happened today if I'd have been where you wanted me at. Because I know God can hold Satan back. And Satan would love to jerk the tar off of my truck just to be able to make me think, Lord, you were that mean of a God? God's not mean, but sometimes God's got to chasten those that he loves. That's what he says. And I'm like old uh, Paul and Silas. I believe it's Paul and Silas. Might have been Peter and John and James, I think it was, when they went up there and they all got whipped. They got put out of the temple. And the Bible says they went away rejoicing that they was found worthy to be striped for Christ's sake. So Brother Jamie, sometimes we can get down on ourselves whenever God's giving us a little spanking. I call them spankings. But sometimes we can suck it up Say, Lord, you got me right where you want me and forgive me. And then you can rejoice in it knowing that he loved you enough to be able to spank you. I thought about this little boy just come to my mind. He said his mommy would tell me all the time, she said, I whoop you because I love you. He said, no, you don't. You whoop me because you was mad. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think God gets mad at us. But God 
gives us a chasten from time to time because he loves us and to correct us. I'm kind of like that little boy too. I used to get a lot of spankings too and I thought Mamaw sure was mad a lot. But now that I've grown up, I noticed Mamaw loved me. Mamaw had to correct me a lot. It wasn't that she, she was mad. I think a few times she had got mad at me but she still loved me through her anger. What does it say to get mad and sin not? I think she was whipping me and wasn't sinning a bit. <laughs> All right. You know, we got to try to pronounce this one. I can't even pronounce it. <laughs> this is the... I can't, I can't even try. Play it, play it. I'm going to bring it to you. We're on number six. I'm going to get you to pronounce it. I can't pronounce it. So you say I'll be able to pronounce it. I'm going Say what? But what is it? What does that word stand for? What does the U stand for? Oh, okay. Well, that's what that was. Okay. I was thinking it was even the lateral. Uh, the same thing in the lateral joint, I think, is trying to be in the lateral joint. Okay. Well. Damn, now. That's the track. You'll know that one. Well, that would be all right, but you know what? A U joint, they all got to do their do their job, or something's gonna give out. <laughs> <laughs> but it's unit on each side. It has a, a certain each side has its own unit part, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah